بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لترى بمقدمه الفداء وما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته As we are fast approaching the final nights of these blessed, blessed majalis and these holy commemorative nights in which insha'Allah we will have utilized to first and foremost replenish our soul, secondly gain an attachment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and on the third level carry on that which we've learned outside the month of Muharram. And insha'Allah as we know because Muharram is the first month in the calendar the Islamic calendar, we can utilize it to have New Year's resolution, seeing and how much we can change till next Muharram comes, and how much of the teachings of Ahlul Bayt we can apply until the next Muharram. Now for tonight's topic, as we s commemorate a youth in which whose name is and will ever be remaining in the beautiful books of history and will be remembered time in and time out. We want to analyze how he came to be that particular youth. What around him from the environmental factors allowed him to be that who he is and why he is remembered till tonight. And inshallah we would like to shed a light on this but before we do that there's an aspect of importance when looking at the battle of Karbala. And that's the comparison that we can look at through three different stages of Islamic history. The first stage, we want to look at the Prophet of Islam. What he went through from trials and tribulations. And who was the main man associated behind these trials and tribulations. The second, we'd like to look at the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al Mu'mineen and the battles that he has had, and the trials and tribulations that he suffered, and from whose hands. And on the third level, we'll begin to realize as a procedure, like father, like son, we find Imam al Hussein will also have an enemy, which is very common to that of Rasulullah and to that of Amir al Mu'mineen. And once we've discussed these three ideas and three stages in Islamic history, we can get a more in-depth understanding of the final battle of Islam. And that's the battle in which Imam Mahdi, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman will come with to give us justice on this earth. And we want to see what relevance do the three figures we're going to relate to tonight about the three particular stages of history and what relevance do we have with Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. So, inshallah, to start off the topic for tonight and to analyze this historical aspect of the trials and tribulations of our Prophet, our Imams, please help me in reciting a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The Prophet of Islam, the messenger, the final messenger, the mercy to mankind. When we begin to analyze his life and we find that he comes forth and has a statement saying there was no prophet that was hurt more than I was. So there is an understanding that yes, our prophet, the mercy to mankind was hurt like no other. But when we want to analyze, and especially to the relevance of the topic for tonight, who was their main people associated with the trials and tribulations that the prophets went through? We stand at a particular instance. 
So the main figure we stand at as being in opposition towards the Prophet of Islam is none other than Abu Sufyan. Now someone can come and say, well, he was his relative. But let's look at how and what he did to harm the Prophet in any manner in which he can. And there's many traditions that we can look at. But it suffice to stand at three particular wars that Abu Sufyan led against the Prophet of Islam. Now before analyzing this, because we're going to go into many wars that we're going to refer to tonight, but we need to take the example of what a war actually intends. When someone comes from one side of an army, and there's another particular figure on another side of an army, let's take Jamal for example. You find there was very prestigious people, not necessarily for good prestige, but there was prestigious people on both sides. Now someone comes and says, well, they're Muslims at the end of the day. Putting a blind eye to the fact that one Muslim comes to the battle to kill the other Muslim. And that's why we have to realize when a war takes place, it doesn't matter who. There's always a right side and a wrong side. And that's why we have to look at the aspect of making sure we need to choose a side. Don't be like Abu Huraira in Safin. You know what Abu Huraira was? You know those people that always don't want to take a side? They know there's something being oppressed and there's someone do the oppressing, but they never take a side because they're both someone that they can benefit from. They always stand in the middle, whoever wins, they follow that particular person. That's what Abu Huraira did in Safin. When he stands on a patch of sand and everyone looks towards this particular narrator of hadith stating, you've narrated so much from the Prophet. Where do you stand when Muawiyah fights Ali ibn Abi Talib? And the reply comes from Abu Huraira stating that the Salah, look at, look at her reply to give you an idea that even he knew who was on the righteous side and who was opposing the message of Islam. Abu Huraira replies by saying the Salat, the Ibadah, behind Ali ibn Abi Talib is much more rewarding. But the food with Muawiyah is a lot better for me. And the standing on this particular patch of sand is a lot better for Abu Huraira. Therefore, I'll stand. Whoever wins, I'll follow them. At the end of the day, they're Muslims. That's the danger of the society nowadays. We stand back. Let's not have an opinion. Let's not care. What's something that happened 1,400 years ago? What's it to do with me tonight? That's the danger. Because you will have to take a side when Imam Mahdi comes. And you'll have to know how they made the decision on the 10th of Muharram in order for you to make your decision when the Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman comes. So that's the first point. When we find the uncle of the Prophet comes, Abu Sufyan comes and rages the first war against Islam, Badr, second year after Hijrah. He brings 950 men. Prophet had 313. Remember that number, because the first and the last battle of Islam shall incur that particular number. 313, victorious, against 950. Look at the quality of the people back then. Keep that number in mind when we discuss later on tonight. Number, quality versus quantity. 313 were victorious on 950. Prophets one side, the opposition army led by Abu Sufyan, his uncle. Second battle in Islam, Uhud, third year after Hijra. He says, well, I'm not going to come back from a massacre some 313 beat us, I'm going to come try again. Third year after Hijrah, Uhud. You find in Uhud when Hamza fell, the wife and the mother of Muawiyah. Look at, look at this family tree to give you an analogy of who fought the Ahlul Bayt and what they were capable of. Abu Sufyan, leader of the army, kills Hamza, the flag bearer of the Prophet of Islam. His wife, Abu Sufyan's wife, the mother of Muawiyah comes. The narration states, she comes to Hamza. First and foremost, she cuts his nose off. 
and she hangs it as a necklace, as an adornment for her. And she does many things with his body until what? The famous narration states that she cuts his stomach open, takes out the kidney and tries to begin chewing it. That's where the line comes, Akilat al-Akbad, isn't it? And that's why many people in history from the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib referred to Muawiyah as the son of Akilat al-Akbad, reminding him who his mother was, what his lineage was when Islam came and who opposed. Third year, and the famous quote by Rasulullah comes in that particular year. When it's fifth year after Hijrah in the Battle of Al-Ahzab, when Abu Sufyan doesn't have any means, no one would let him in. So the only, the only way he could fight the Prophet of Islam is making a covenant with a particular Jewish tribe by the name of Bani Qaynuqa. And he says to the tribe, I'm going to beat Muhammad. Sallu alayhi. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. I'll beat this messenger. They say, you've already tried twice and you failed miserably. What makes you think that you'll beat him this time? Abu Sufyan says, I have a person in my army that the entire Arabian Peninsula fears. Who's that? Amr ibn Abdul al Amri. The narration states to us, that he was worth 1,000 men. If you had him in an army, and you had 1,000 in an army, you'd count your army as to, to be 2,000 because he was in the army. Look at how much of a presence that person had. So Ben Uqayn Uqa says, well, not a problem. Come within our side of Medina and attack the Prophet if you have this particular person. And we know exactly what happened on that day. When the Prophet of Islam tells every single person, whoever goes out and fights Amr, I'll guarantee him Jannah. On three occasions he says it. And on three occasions no one comes forth in fear of who Amr was. And the narration state to us that they were so silent. Imagine being that fearful that they hesitated to move even in the slightest instance. No, she says it's, it's as if they had birds nesting on their head. Can you imagine how still you have to be for a bird to nest on your head? That's how still they were. In case they make a sudden movement and the Prophet said, hey, you moved, come. Only person comes for three times. Ali ibn Abi Talib. In case someone says, well, the Prophet didn't choose me. I put my hands up. Three times the Prophet says, oh, Ali. This is Amr. Oh, Ali, this is Amr. Oh, Ali, this is Amr. In which Ali comes forth and states, So what if he's Amr? I'm Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that's why we have the instance on that battlefield where the Prophet comes with a statement. Two major statements that we can utilize in any debate that we have. Both books. Open up any historical book, this is related. Prophet has two instances, two merity attributes towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. Number one, he says, the entire faith has gone out to fire the entire evil, isn't it? Now the Prophet could have easily come forth and said, well, faith or a person that has faith went out to someone that has evil inside him. But look at the wording of the Prophet, the entire faith, encompassing Ali ibn Abi Talib, the entire faith went out against the entire evil. Number one, the second merit, what was it? It says the strike of Ali ibn Abi Talib that day was worth more on the scales of balance then the entire worship of both humans and of jinn until the day of judgment. I think that needs a, needs a salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. One strike, why? Because when Amr ibn Abdawid spat at Ali ibn Abi Talib's face, anyone that had an opportunity to kill this great warrior would have taken it and not hesitated. 
Ali ibn Abi Talib stops there and then. And he goes around in circles. Then he comes back and beheads Amr. And when asked why he does that, he replies by saying, when Amr spat at me, I felt an anger inside me, enraged. So I feared that I might strike him through my anger and not the anger that I should have. That this is a disbeliever in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I calmed down while circumambulating around the battle. And then I came when I knew exactly what I was doing and what I was striking. And I knew how Allah viewed the strike before, during and after. And only then did I take that strike. So that's what happened in the third battle of Islam. Raged by the uncle of the Prophet. Now let's see, this uncle of his, because someone can come and say, well, he became Muslim later on. He raged three wars. He became a Muslim because there was a sword on his neck. He had no choice. And look at the ideology of these uncles. There was good uncles. We had Abu Talib and we had the Abu Jahls. When the Prophet comes and says that Fir'aun Fir'aun is greater than Abu Jahl. What do we learn from that? Fir'aun is greater than Abu Jahl. Why? He says Fir'aun in the last instance, the dying moments of his life when he sees everything that the, Prophet, that the Prophet Musa brings forth from miracles. As the sea collides and he's drowning, he says, I believe in the Lord of Musa. He says, look at Abu Jahl when he's fighting in the battle of Badr. He falls. Does he say, well, give me a chance. I want to come towards the religion. Teach me. What does he say? A person comes to him and is about to finish him off. So he looks at the prophet. He says, oh, prophet. He doesn't call him prophet, but he calls him by his name. He says, I don't want to be killed by this person. The prophet says, why? He says, what would the Arabs say about me if a short person was to kill me? I want a tall person to kill me. Fir'aun greater than Abu Jahl. That's the instance that we have. Ignorance. Let's look at how this ignorance is still alive till today. That's number one. Mu'awiyah, second level. Prophet... Abu Sufyan, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Muawiyah, Imam Hussein, Yazid, descendants, Muawiyah rages a battle, Safin, thousands upon thousands killed, Muawiyah curses and raises the idea to curse Amir al Mu'mineen on the pulpits after the Adhan. It carried on for 70 years. Look at the audacity these people had towards the Ahlul Bayt. The anger they had towards Ahlul Bayt. The hatred they had towards Ahlul Bayt. To give you an idea of who fought Imam Hussein on the 10th of Muharram. Muawiyah. So much so that he tried to buy as much as he can from the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib. However, he tried in many different means to bring forth the army of Ali ibn Abi Talib to be part of his army. And we have a great example that can teach us two things. Number one, that Muawiyah was trying his utmost best to draw in anyone from the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And number two, if you have a solid belief, nothing can make it shaky. The example is one of Ali ibn Abi Talib's men by the name of Abu Aswad al duali He has a daughter. I've narrated this in, in Ramadan. But let's look at the beauty of this narration. To teach ourselves, if we teach our children at a young age, they have that flame for Ahl al-Bayt, it can never be extinguished, no matter how old or how young they are. Muawiyah, how we used to buy how he used to get people towards his army or towards his side. Many different means. One of the means is bribery. 
So he'd know that Ali ibn Abi Talib's people weren't the, necessarily the most rich. They were in a state of poverty. So he would leave gifts here and there. One of the gifts he left at Abu Aswad al-Du'ali's house was honey that had saffron inside. So you imagine you're in poverty, you have nothing to eat or drink. Then you have outside your house a jar of honey, which was significantly rare. Not only that, it was honey that had saffron inside. Six-year-old girl, Abu Aswad Ali's daughter, opens the door, finds honey, takes it, takes a scoop. Imagine how she felt then and then. Wow. Haven't tasted this in a while. So her father comes. Look at how he tests her. Oh, daughter, do you know who this honey is from? She says, no, father, I found it outside the door. He says, this is from Muawiyah. Trying to get people towards him or to like him. Look what the daughter does. Six years of age. Six years of age. She puts her hand in the back of her throat until she regurgitates everything she just ate. Because we know the traditions that say, Imam Sadiq, when asked, why did Muslims fight Muslims? He says, because their stomachs have been filled with haram. She regurgitates everything that she just ate. However pleasant and beautiful she thought it was. Then she looks towards Damascus and she says these lines. So she states that you tried to bribe us into leaving Ali ibn Abi Talib with a May honey that's covered in a flavor of saffron. She says, no way will we go towards you when we have a great man like Ali ibn Abi Talib. So the idea is there and then. Muawiyah, just like his father fought the prophets, he fights Ali ibn Abi Talib. And likewise, Yazid fights Imam Hussein. And that's why we have the tradition, who was Yazid? Who put him in the pulpit in the first place? When we look at the traditions that tell us about the merits of Yazid, not in our books, of other books of thought, the only merits they attribute to him is one of five. The first is that he liked to be in the presence of boys that didn't have any facial hair. You think of that one. Number two, he liked to see monkeys fighting. Number three, he liked to see bears and frogs fighting. Number four, he'd always be in the presence of dances. Number five, not only was he always intoxicated, he'd used to utilize his power to get each individual ingredient for the wines that he produced from every single place of outskirts of the entire empire. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. These are the merits that come forth and state about Yazid. Other things that we don't know, that are not mentioned about Yazid. He has a monkey. He names this monkey. He calls it a Baqais. Look at the audacity of this man to give you an idea of how much of an ignorant society those people were, but because of money, because of positions, because they were following the majority. They follow a man like Yazid. And that's why we have to understand why Imam Hussein said that a person like me will never give his bay'ah to a person like Yazid. Yazid on an occasion, with his monkey Abu Qais, he takes him horse riding. He thinks to himself, it's very wise to let my monkey ride a horse. And he found it funny. Monkey, how does he know how to ride a horse? As if it, and uh, horse riding is difficult for a man, let alone a monkey. So he lets his pet ride the horse. Doesn't know how to ride it. Falls down, hits his head, he dies. Everything's fine now. Till now, everything's fine. Monkey dies. What does Yazid do? Yazid, the killer of Imam Hussein, throws a party when the sabaya come in. What does he do when his monkey dies? And this is the 
filth of history when we look at these people that sat on the pulpit of the Prophet of Islam. Three days. He has what we look at to be a commemorative institute where he wore black and he made everyone commemorate the death of his monkey. People come to him. I'm sorry for your loss. What loss? Monkey. Killer of who, Imam Hussein? Commemorates a monkey. That's the person that Yazid was. The person three years in Khilafah, the first year he kills Imam Hussein. Sayyidai Shabab Ahlil Jannah. The second year he desecrates the shrine of the prophets. Third year he burns the Kaaba. Khalifa. People till tonight say, may Allah have mercy on him. People till tonight say that. The idea we need to look at tonight. <laughs> Prophet Abu Sufyan. Imam Ali Muawiyah. Imam Hussein Yazid, and that's why in our traditions when Imam Sahib al Asri was Zaman comes, who will be his opposition? Person by the name of a Sufyani, isn't it? I want to ask you, why Sufyani? It's obvious, isn't it? He's a descendant of who? First battle in Islam, last battle in Islam. 313, 313. Prophet. In his message, the Mahdi in the manifestation. The enemy, Abu Sufyan, his descendant, Sufyan. When you look at history repeating itself, there's an in-depth look we need to analyze. And that's why when we look in history, in the depths of history, we look at the people nowadays. When we look at these groups that are emerging and emerging and emerging, and they begin to split and split, each day a new name, each day a new fight, each day more ignorance than the last. We look at their forefathers. When Imam Ali sends a messenger towards Damascus, look at this, I want you to look at this in depth, brothers and sisters. He sends a messenger to Damascus to give a message to Muawiyah. On the way, as he's riding, he gets stopped by someone, one of Muawiyah's men. When he stopped, he says, that which you ride is mine. That Jamal, he says, that Jamal is mine. He says, I've just come from Ali ibn Abi Talib. How can this one be yours? He says, I'm going to take you to a court of law. He says, oh, take me to a court of law. Goes to a court of law. So the judge of the time tells the messenger from Ali ibn Abi Talib, do you have any witnesses that this camel is yours? He says, no. He says, but this camel is in my possession. You need to give me a witness from the other side stating that this camel is theirs. We didn't want to get too much into the jurisprudence of it. But if someone has possession, you need shahood, witnesses to say that this isn't, here, this isn't theirs. So the person comes and says, tomorrow I'll get you the witnesses. Not a problem. Wait till tomorrow. Can you believe the next day that person from Muawiyah's army brings forth 40 people to say that Jamal was that person's, not Imam Ali's messengers. Imam Ali's messenger says, not a problem. He is brought, with, he's brought forth witnesses, not a problem. Take it. Muawiyah smiles. He looks at the messenger from Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, what's the matter? What's wrong? He says... Do you see my governorship? Justice. He says, it's not that I'm surprised that a lie just went through in the court of Allah, in a court of law. He says, why? He says, number one, the audacity is he just produced 40 people to lie for him saying that this Jamal is that person's when it's not. He says, then why is it that you smile? He says, this isn't even a Jamal. This is a naqa. The people that came forth to bear witness that this Jamal was that person's all bear witness that it's a Jamal. He says the irony is it's not a male, it's a female. So if you've brought forth 40 people to witness in the wrong 
something that doesn't even exist. And Muawiyah tells him this, and I need you to pay attention to this. He says, go take my message to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Tell Ali ibn Abi Talib, I fight you with an army that doesn't know the difference between a naqa and a jamal. That's the army I bring forth. I tell them, follow me in this. They follow me blindly. And the people we find nowadays producing groups. You come talk to them about religion. What's religion? Our fulan scholar said, don't listen towards the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt because they're magicians. Just like we said, history repeats itself. When the Prophet brought the message of Islam, what did they call him? A magician. History repeats itself. That's why when we look at the depths of the catastrophes in the tenth of Muharram, what do we see? We see because of the audacity of a person burning the house of the Prophet, we find someone having the audacity to burn the tents of Abu Abdullah. Just like a person had the audacity to kill an infant known as Muhsin, still in the womb of his mother Fatima, we find that people have audacity to kill a six month old in the hands of his father. Just like people had the audacity to break a rib behind the door of Rasulullah, we find an audacity of people that come forth to trample on the body and break the ribs of Aba Abdullah. We see the comparison now. We see how history repeats itself. We see why 313? Because it's quality, not quantity. At the start of time, people were firm. That's the first battle of Islam. Do you know what happened in the last battle in the Prophet's time? The battle of Hunayn. 12,000 strong Muslims. Prophet puts them in two different ranks. 6,000 with Ali ibn Abi Talib, 6,000 with Khalid. Imam Ali tells Khalid, don't go in the valley, it's dangerous. They'll attack you from the top of that valley. Khalid, I'm going to go in the valley. Goes in the valley, people start attacking him. The Muslims, 12,000 strong, fighting an army which was half their number, 5,000. 12,000, 5,000. First battle, what do we say? 313 verse 950. Quality, not quantity. We had 12,000 in Hunayn. They had five. They ran the Muslims. You know how many people defended the Prophet of Islam? 12,000 people we have. To give you an idea how many of us and how much Muslims we have in the world now, it's not by numbers when we say 3 billion. The Imam is waiting for 313. Do you know how many people left protecting the Prophet of Islam? You'd think thousands maybe, hundreds, in the tens, out of 12,000, eight people were defending the Prophet of Islam. Eight people. Quality, not quantity. Never about quantity. It's never about I pray a thousand rak'ahs a day. Pray two rak'at, knowledge with knowledge. That's why two rak'at of a knowledgeable person is worth 70 of any other. Knowledge, let it become that which you apply to your life. And what we need to know from tonight, brothers and sisters, and this is the important thing that you need to take home from tonight. The enemies of Aba Abdullah were Muslim. Remember that. Muslim. They too believed in the Prophet of Islam. They too believed in Tawheed. They too prayed, fasted. However, let's look at what differentiated the 72 on one side from the 30,000 on the other. And once we can isolate the factors and the characteristics that made the 72 of Imam Hussein who they are, that's when we can take those characteristics and say, we want to hold on to any of the Ashab and be like any of the Ashab and we'll reach salvation. And one day we can say, inshallah, with the blessing of Allah, that we can be of the soldiers of Imam Sahib al-Asri was zaman So we pray to Allah on this note and on a final chapter.
to allow us to understand history in more depth, firstly. Secondly, to apply it to our lives in a matter of seeing where we are now, where we would have been if Karbala was to take place tomorrow, and where we need to be as a character, as ethical perspectives, as knowledge, as friends, because you have to remember who their friend circles were and how we can grow as a community to achieve a rank in which we can say we are the companions of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman So we pray to Allah on that note with the Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha, but before it, three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.